We want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. My name is Amy Stevenson. I'm the communications manager for MICA. And um, I would really like to thank Kelly uh, Mackey Foster. She's from Lakeshore Legal Aid. She is, uh, it's an understatement, the subject matter expert on the very complicated eviction process. She's the Detroit eviction director. And she'll be uh, walking through some really critical information with you today. And I think everybody's been through this enough to know a lot of the housekeeping, but um, if you do have questions, there's a Q&A section at the bottom of the bar. Um, if you could toss your questions in there, that would be great. And we'll be monitoring that. And also uh, for those of you that may not have been on the call at the time, we do understand this is scheduled on a holiday. At the time we scheduled it, it was not a federally or state recognized holiday, um, but we will have it recorded and posted so that if there's staff members or as a team, you wanna view this later, it'll be in our YouTube channel and I'll um, send the link out on our social media channels and our newsletters so that this will be made available to you. Um, thank you to everyone who introduced themselves in the chat. And I wanna thank Susan, my team member who's here today as well. Um, and we're up to almost 90 people, um, which is one of our uh, best attended, attended events. So Kelly, that tells you this is certainly a hot topic, so no pressure, but um, I'm going to turn it over to you and thanks everyone on behalf of us at MICA for joining this morning. Thanks, Amy. Um, okay, so as Amy said, I am the Detroit Eviction Prevention Director at Lakeshore Legal Aid. Um, we cover Oakland, Macomb, and Wayne counties, but we also do intake for legal aid across the state of Michigan through our Council and Advocacy Law Line. Um, I'm also on the MICA Board of Directors, so I'm happy to be here with all of you for that reason as well. Um, and I like to start off and say I am extremely biased. <laughs> I have represented tenants for, uh, I think I'm at 17 years now, and so I know there are good landlords, absolutely. However, as a tenant's attorney, like my presentations are always swayed a little bit that way. So don't hate me if you're a landlord, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there, don't, please don't be offended. Um, okay, so just to get started, I put some, uh, both of these are live links in the PowerPoint, but they are fantastic resources for case managers and for the public. And so the first one is it's called the Practical Guide to Landlords and Tenants. It's created by uh, the Michigan State University Law School Housing Clinic and uh, Michigan Legislature. So there are paper ones of those that you can request from uh, your state reps or it's available online and that's the link that is there. I like it a lot. It has some timelines and really uh, explains the processes in non-lawyer speak. So that's great. The other link is Michigan Legal Help, and that is a website. Um, this is also linked in there. Michigan Legal Help is a partnership between the Michigan State Bar and uh, the Michigan Advocacy Program. And there is all sorts of information on all different types of law that is up there. There's also forms, there's a chat function um, if people have questions. And if you haven't gone on Michigan Legal Help before, I encourage you to do so, especially uh, working with people who are uh, unhoused. Okay. Uh, as Amy said at the top, at the start, Please feel free if you have questions throughout the process, um, put them in the Q&A, uh, raise your hand, and then we should have some time at the end for questions as well. Um, okay, so these are the topics that we are going to talk about today. Um, so the first is about what a tenancy is, notice for evictions, the summons and complaint, court, judgment and conditional dismissals, a writ of eviction, and then security deposit. So actually, let me skip back for a second. So tenancy. Uh, the tenancy means what type of relationship the owner of the property has with the people who are living there. Um, and so that may be that they um, have a month to month lease and they don't have a written lease uh, or that they do have a written lease, um, which is usually for one year in Michigan, but it doesn't have to be. It could be for shorter or for longer. Um, 
And so that puts you in the position of what your rights are determining on how you enter the property and processes that your landlord has to follow based on how you enter the property. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. So there are, I think, three different processes in the uh, context of evictions for uh, non-payment. I'm sorry, there's one for non-payment, there is one for termination of tenancy, and then there's one that is a land contract forfeiture. Um, each one of those have notice requirements that change depending on what type of case the landlord wants to file and what notice is required. So there's lots of interchangeable names that actually mean the same thing. So in a non-payment of rent case, uh, a notice, they may just call it a seven day notice. They may also call it a demand for possession or DFP. Those are all the same things. Um, and so for non-payment of rent, those cases are just like uh, the name implies, it's for non-payment of rent only. Um, there can be some fees that are brought with that at the same time, but that type of case can't be started if you want to evict somebody for any reason other than non-payment. Um, there are a couple of special rules for people who are in mobile home parks or in subsidized housing, but uh, the landlord in that scenario can proceed down the, the non-payment of rent lane, if you will. Uh, the next is for a termination of tenancy. So you'll hear termination of tenancy or a 30 day notice or a notice to quit, all the same thing. Um, and what that case is, is not necessarily about non-payment. It's about something else that's happened that the landlord wants to get their property back. And so that could be there was a lease, but it's ended or because of violations of the lease. Um, a holdover tenancy, which um, can happen in a couple of different scenarios when somebody comes into the property um, lawfully and then the owner wants you to uh, leave and you haven't like, met the demand to leave. And so that's considered a holdover tenancy. Um, and then month to month. So for people who are, um, anyone who does not have a written lease, it it, is, it defaults to a month to month tenancy. And so for that reason, if the owner wants the property back, they just have to give 30 days notice and nothing else um, to a tenant before they can terminate their tenancy. And so the difference between that is, is if someone is in the middle of a lease, um, you're not able to just pick and give 30 days notice to terminate the tenancy if they're in the middle of a lease. They can only do that if there's some type of violation um, that's happened. Um, I also wanted to just touch on land contract forfeiture. So um, we have lots of land contracts throughout the state of Michigan, particularly in the city of Detroit. Um, it's a lot. And so that has its own different proceedings in evictions. And so it's a special notice, it's a special court procedure, um, and things that have to happen if there's a land contract. And so we sometimes see land contracts where the owner is trying to terminate a tenancy and that's not proper if it's actually a land contract. Um, we also see a lot of people who think they're in a land contract and it's actually um, a lease with an option or something like that or a rent to own. Um, and then those proceed down the termination of tenancy if it's actually not a land contract. Um, okay, so touching on uh, special notices. So we got Non-payment of rent, seven days. Termination of tenancy, 30 days. Land contract forfeiture, 15 days. And so that notice period, what it actually means is you have the, um, that's the top period of time that you as a tenant need to correct whatever's in the notice before they can file a complaint for eviction against you. So for non-payment of rent, it's that seven days. In between, If you pay what's due on the fifth day, the landlord can't file a complaint against you. Um, if during a 30-day notice, they say there's a lease violation and you cure it somehow, um, they cannot go forward and file an eviction against you. And I saw somebody had their hand up. Um, maybe Kim, maybe. 
Okay, I'll keep going. Um, I she did have her hand up, and I clicked on that she could speak. Kim, are you there? Did you have a question, Kim Houston? Nope, it was an accident, but thank oh, you. I appreciate no worries. It. Just didn't <laughs> want to overlook you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> it's the modern day version of a butt dial, I would say. No <laughs> Um, so the, the 30 day and the seven day notice are really what we see most often and that people talk about, but there are a couple of um, distinct situations where a different notice period uh, is allowable. So one is unlawful drug activity. And so if there's a police report that there's drug activity on the property, the landlord can just give them a 24 hour notice before they file to evict. We don't see that a lot, but it does happen. Um, the most important thing to know for that in terms of tenants rights is that there has to be a police report as well. Doesn't that mean that there's somebody who's been charged or convicted or any of it. All it just means is that there's a police report that's been made regarding drugs. And so the landlord can use that to evict someone. Um, another scenario are either health hazards or damage to the premises. And so if the landlord is asserting that there's a health hazard at the property or there's damage, they only have to give seven day notice period for them to either correct it or to move. So the health hazard or damage to premises comes up in a couple of different ways. But for us at Legal Aid, the way that we see this the most is for our clients who are hoarders. And so if um, a tenant, you know, has hoarding that's at their property, a landlord can file a health hazard um, against them. And also, it can also fit, fall under the damage to premises category. Now, there's defenses to that and different things that we can do. But that's, um, for the most part, what health hazard notices are about. The damage to premises could be the hoarding, but it also could be something like if um, there's if there's been like a broken window or the tenant has like flooded something um, under those kind of scenarios, they can allege that it's dam dam damage to premises and do it as a seven day notice. And then the last one is trespass. And so what trespass trespass means is that someone is in the property, but they didn't have a legal right to enter to the property. So um, if somebody was uh, had a lease with an owner and that owner sold the property to a new owner, the new owner can't say that those tenants are trespassing because they're not trespassing. They came lawfully onto the property. Um, it's just the landlord or the owner who is new. Um, this is also when people talk about squatters. I hate the term squatters, but this is trespass is really what people mean and why it's important about if they entered the pro property lawfully or not. Um, if they did, then they should get the 30 day notice if they're not in the middle of a lease. Um, so they should get the 30 day notice before they would have to move. But if it's a tr an actual trespass, which does happen, but not a lot. Um, if it is an actual trespass, no notice is required. So the landlord does not have to provide any type of notice that he can go straight to court to file a summons and complaint. I Kelly, see. there are two questions in the Q&A relating to some of the information you just covered. Do you mind taking a moment and reading them and answering them? Sure. Um, does a landlord have to take a tenant to court, even if they give them a 30 day notice on a month to month lease? Um, yes, kind of. So, um, the 30 day notice on the month to month lease, if the, the tenant moves, which is like the goal of the notice, then no, they don't have to do anything if the, uh, tenant vacates. Um, but if the tenant doesn't vacate, that's when, yes, you have to file after the 30 day notice. Um, and the next wanted to confirm, did you say that a landlord cannot give a notice to quit if someone is in the middle of a lease longer than a month to month? <laughs> this one is kind of as well. So if you are in the middle of um, a lease, generally speaking, you can't be evicted unless you're violating one of the rules of the property or a uh, 
or you're um, breaching the lease agreement. So um, if you are disturbing the quiet enjoyment of your neighbors or you, know, you lit your apartment on fire, even though you are in a uh, year long lease, you can still be terminated by a 30 day notice uh, at that point. Um, what happens if a tenant makes a partial payment on a 30 day notice? Great. Um, so this is another, it depends. So if someone, uh, this is what's called Port Park Forest. It's uh, a case from like the 80s in the city of Detroit, which basically says if a 30 day notice is served on a tenant, right? So 30 day notice is saying, uh, you're not rightfully here. I want my property back. But if they collect some of the rent and they accept it during that notice period, the tenant has a defense to that um, eviction. And basically they go in and say um, that basically the landlord is sending them mixed signals <laughs> that yes, I'm gonna take your rent so that you can stay, but I also want you out. Important thing about the anonymous question is about, is about partial payments. So, partial payment doesn't necessarily invalidate a 30-day notice. So what really, um, from a landlord perspective, if you want to terminate a tenancy between when you serve the notice and file the summons and complaint, you shouldn't accept rent. Um, because if you accept rent, uh, so a legal aid attorney may come in and say they don't really want to terminate the tenancy, they're accepting rent from my client. Um, it's also difficult with the partial payment um, because they can accept part of it and it makes it a little harder for uh, a legal aid lawyer to argue that they, the case should be dismissed because there is still an amount that's owed um, and which comes up all the time. Um, if your tenant invites other to live, others to live with them, is that considered a trespass? It is not. Um, it would be considered a violation of the lease. So presumably in the lease, it would say these are the people who can live at the property. Um, and if they invited somebody else to live, that would be uh, a 30 day notice to terminate. Um, and so, and the trespass, even though you didn't authorize this person being there by virtue of the, the tenant having rightfully and lawfully entered into the property, if they're letting someone come in, it's the landlord, it's going to be really hard to, um, you have to jump through a couple of hoops, I guess is what I want to say before you can get that. And it's usually like a boyfriend or right who, who moves in or a relative, um, but it doesn't rise to the level of trespass. You still, the landlord have to give notice. Um, can you give the payment back and therefore not accept? This is a great question because uh, it, it happens. It absolutely happens. So um, you can give the payment back and therefore not accept. Um, and we, we do see that. And it's usually a, a, a legal aid lawyer saying like, they're not acting in good faith. They collected the rent and then they rejected it and sent it back. Um, so I, that's kind of like a, it's wishy-washy and depends on who the judge is, where you live, how they feel about um, once a tenant has made a payment and the landlord then gives it back to not accept. Um, we've got lots of great questions. I'm just gonna keep on going. Um, if a tenant invited someone to stay for a few days and they refuse to leave, is the 30 day notice required? Yes. Um, unless you can show that there's one of those uh, exceptions or such special circumstances where it's like there's a health hazard because of the new person or um, there's damage to the property or there's drugs. Um, if it falls under that, then you can potentially get the person out before that. But otherwise, it'll have to be a 30 day notice for the uh, person who is now at the property. We've heard from many clients recently that their landlord is telling them the rental property has been sold. Is there any protection for a tenant in that situation or will they only get the 30 days to move out? So um, this happens all the time too. If somebody is in the middle of a lease, then they get more than 30 days. The new owner has to honor the remainder of the lease. And at the end of the lease, then they, then they have to start the 30 days from that point. Um, let's see. 
So basically, if a, a property owner sells the property, we say the new owner stands in the shoes of the original uh, owner. And so they have to honor the lease agreement um, that existed before they became the owner. Um, once that lease is up, if they don't want to extend it, the tenant then becomes a month to month tenant, and then they can be evicted with the 30 days after the lease expires. Great question. Um, okay. What do we got next? Oh, what has to be in the notice? Um, so in Michigan, there is what's called SCAO, which is the Supreme Court Administrative Office, and they create forms uh, as one of their functions. And so I'm going to show you some examples of what those look like. I will say in landlord tenant law, landlords almost always use these um, uh, forms that were created by the court, but they don't have to. If they, as long as the notice that they give or the complaint that they give meets all of their requirements, then they can write it on a piece of paper. They don't have to use the form, um, but most people do because it has uh, everything that needs to legally be there. So um, the notice but must be written, clearly state the reason for the eviction, and then give the tenant time to cure. So I'm going to talk about that for a minute. So for someone who is in the middle of a lease um, and the tenant, or I'm sorry, the landlord's trying to terminate um, in the middle of the lease for lease violations, it needs to, the notice needs to say more than something like a lease violation at the end or violation of paragraph F. Like that is not specific enough for, to put the tenant on notice of what they're in violation of. So you could say a violation of paragraph seven and then say whatever it is that they've done, which I could be moving someone else into the property. Um, or it could be they, uh, I don't know, they've got garbage in the front yard or something like that. So it has to actually uh, be specific enough for the tenant to know what the eviction is for. Um, and the, the logic behind that is you're giving a 30 day notice saying you're in violation of the lease under that scenario. Um, and the tenant has the right to try to cure that violation. And so um, if it is that they've got couches and cars in the front yard during that 30 day peak time period, um, if they clean up everything and that means that they've cured the landlord isn't supposed to still proceed on eviction with that because they were in their notice period and took care of whatever it was that the um, landlord says that you're in violation of um, for service so the notice has to be served which just means really like handed to um, the tenants they only have to do it for one of the uh, one tenant who lives there. And for the notice, it can be either um, served in person by handing it, it can be posted at the property, um, or it can be sent in mail, in the mail. Um, right now, some leases uh, stipulate that it can be served electronically through email, but it's not part of the statute, but that if the parties agree, they can be served that way. Um, almost always the landlord posts this at the property as the way of effectuating the notice. And I see there's more questions. Oh, that's a long one. Um, let's see. I'm going to pause on that one because it's going to take me a minute to read it. And thank you, Kelly. I was trying to message her directly that we might table that one for a second. <laughs> I was just in the process of messaging Miss or Miss Lawrence. So perfect. Okay. Um, so it's a little blurry, but I wanted to give you um, some of these screenshots of the SCA forms that I am talking about. And so this one is um, for non-payment of rent, right? I can't see at the very top because I have my toolbar that's there. Um, but what you should know about the notices for these is what's at the very top is what is important to know, um, one, how much time you have before uh, a complaint can be filed against you, um, and also what they're, what they're trying to allege. So this one's for non-payment of rent. Uh, 
And then the next one is the termination of tenancy. And so it's a little blurry, but so you guys get what I'm trying to do here. Um, the termination of tenancy is a, um, a notice to recover possessions of a possession of the property. Um, okay, so for the non-payment, get to the stage where a tenant has been served with that seven day and you're in the middle of that seven day period, I should say um, they don't have to file right after that seven days uh, expires. They can wait. Um, I don't want to say the exact amount of time because it's dependent on the law, but so they can, they can um, file within a couple of months still of the non-payment and it be, and using that notice, which would be okay. Um, so for non-payment, there are a couple of things and, and COVID has changed a lot. So um, there's going to be times where I'm talking and I'll like say there's a caveat because of things that have happened during COVID. Um, but an important thing for people to know is at the notice stage, there does not have to be a summons and complaint for someone to go to DHHS or go to my bridges and apply for state emergency relief. Um, different communities have different perceptions of this and my cat's going to walk back and, front and forth in front of me for a while, guys, sorry. Um, the, uh, see, she made me lose my train of thought too. I'm talking about SCR. So in SCR, um, there, we only need a notice. Okay. And so a landlord may say, I have to file this complaint against you because you're not going to get any help unless you have a judgment, um, which is not true. So, uh, I always like to point that out at that at this point. Like so, before anybody ends up in court and it's a non-payment issue, clients go apply for SCR. And applying for SCR is also important if you're going to be eligible for additional funds that are available in the community. So, lots of like nonprofits who have funding for um, homeless prevention or rapid rehouse uh, require that an SCR application has been done before the um, nonprofit will provide assistance. So in Michigan, you're supposed to be able to go to your HARA that's in the county. And so the HARA is the Housing Assessment and Resource Agency. Um, and so there's the traditional eviction prevention funds like ESG that can be used um, for people to catch up with their rent. Um, right now, we are towards the end of what's called the SARA program. And so SARA is uh, COVID emergency rental assistance. Um, before that, there was eviction prevention funds. Um, right now, the SARA program uh, provides for back rent and future rent and back utilities and future utilities. Um, depending on the circumstances, it can also help someone um, relocate depending on what's happening. Um, and it also gives some protections for the tenant if there's a court case that's going on. So I say that we are almost at the end of Sarah. So uh, what that means for all of us, if you don't know, is that June 30th at 9 p.m. is the hard deadline to get everything in for a, a Sarah application. So any of the supporting documents that are needed all needs to be in the MISHTA portal by 9 p.m. Um, and I also have the note that uh, new applications also mean recertifications. So somebody who had Sarah maybe several months ago and they still have more eligibility left in their Sarah payments, they can reapply, which is recertify to get additional future months rent paid. Kelly, there's a question in the chat, the second one from um, Nikki about Sarah, some of which you answered, but do you mind just glancing through that because it's applicable? Yeah. Here. Thank you. Sure. Um, can you touch on how eviction process might look different if a tenant has a Sarah application in process? So one is if there's a Sarah application in process, um, there's a order that says uh, the tenant cannot be evicted while it's being processed. Um, and so that comes up a lot. <laughs> um, 
what usually happens is in court, they will give an adjournment for the application to move forward. Um, but usually the tenant like has to show that they're making progress uh, on the CRI application. Um, we also say if someone um, in a non-payment of rent case received SARA funds and were paid out and, and received three future months of rent, which is the standard, if you're in one of those future three months and they say, I want to terminate this tenancy, the tenant has a defense to that eviction because they've been paid already through that three month period, um, even if they're trying to terminate the tenancy, which has come up and is a bit confusing and the judges aren't used to it at all. <laughs> so um, the SARA application though is supposed to be a bar to being evicted. Is there a point when they could be evicted anyway? And so I'll say um, that absolutely once that three um, month payment, like so the three future months payment, if they are eligible for additional months, um, then they shouldn't be evicted. But what we're seeing now is that people have, max, have maxed out their SARA assistance. And so landlords are now filing termination of tenancies to get people out of the property. Um, because of how long the SARA process takes, that is on point. Um, and so, uh, I practice mostly in Detroit where there's an overwhelming need and applications and cases have been adjourned over and over and over again while Sarah's being processed. And so like, if that's a defense, usually is really up to the judge. The judge may say, I'm gonna keep on adjourning it multiple times while this gets processed and wants <laughs> to be updated of kind of where it is at in the stage. And then can the landlord raise rent while the application is in process? <clears throat> um, the, so this is a great question. The landlord, can they raise the rent? Well, it's in the middle. So they can, if they are uh, a month to month tenant or they're not in the middle of a lease, they can raise rent with 30 days notice. So there is a scenario, I think, where um, Sarah has made a payout. Um, the landlord gives a notice that says, I'm raising your rent, um, whatever it might be, in 30 days by however much. Um, and that would be legal, <laughs> which seems unfair, but it's true um, that they would be able to go ahead and go forward with that. Um, and one of the other things about the SARA program uh, is that it provides or it has provided funding for legal services attorneys. And so uh, there are in each jurisdiction in Michigan, there are attorneys who are strictly funded to prevent evictions, which has been great. Um, but it also means that some of the laws that never used to be enforced or have landlords be held to um, are coming up all the time. And it's particularly in Detroit, people are frustrated that we are uh, raising defenses that have not traditionally been raised, but they're there and they're the law and the landlord should have to follow the law. Uh, okay, so the next step is the summons and complaint stage. So this has to be done once uh, after whatever the notice period is. So after seven days or after 30 days, the landlord, if the rent hasn't been paid or whatever the violation cured, they can file a summons and complaint and that's what starts the court case. Um, the landlord, if there is a lease, is supposed to attach that to the complaint along with the notice that oftentimes does not happen. For service of the complaint, it has to happen two ways. So it always has to be delivered in the mail um, and plus one, as we say. So one is personally, so personal service just is handing the document to somebody. Um, it can also be handed to um, any member of the household who is of suitable age, they say, so basically like a teenager, um, and ask that it be delivered to the tenant. So this is basically like 
a, we put it in the mail. I don't ever see the parent who lives at the property, but I see the kid, we can give that to them, which I won't say what my real thoughts about that are. Um, okay. And then if uh, a landlord has tried many times to do one of those and is not able to, the tenant, um, can, or I'm sorry, the landlord can post it at the rental office of, if there is actually one at the property. Um, and the hear, a hearing can be held three days after the tenant is served. Um, and that's kind of a before COVID rule. Uh, Amy, do I have anything in the chat I should look at? Um, uh, there was just a comment and I apologize. I've been responding to somebody else about the slides. Um, <laughs> you are a popular person, Kelly. <laughs> um, so let me scroll up because I don't want to overlook it. Um, I, Susan had commented a close friend recently applied um, for an SER here in Michigan and was told that it is required to have an eviction notice before they will help. And then a few other folks, um, Shelby Lake chimed in and said the same thing or has been denied SER due to not having a notice. And then Danielle mentioned she, they had the, that person had the same thing also. So that was just commented if you wanted to elaborate on that. I would love to elaborate on that because this is <laughs> thank you for those that commented that it took me a minute to circle back there. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. And so um, that means that they are in violation of the law. Um, so it is uh, DHHS. It's very clear in their regulations that um, only a notice is required, but their like common practice has been oftentimes that some DHHS offices uh, say otherwise. And that's what it sounds like people have pointed out. In those cases, get them to legal aid, um, have them contact CALL, which is our uh, counseling advocacy law line. Um, they can also apply online at Michigan Legal Help because that's a case um, as a legal aid attorney, I will take in a second because uh, it's very clear what the law says and it will make a change in that DHHS office that will better benefit systemically for people who uh, should be getting SCR when they're at their notice. Um, okay. So I've got here, the next ones are uh, the SCAO forms. Again, don't have to be used, but they're almost always are. Um, so this first one is the complaint for non-payment of rent. And then I've highlighted in the middle of it for you what I think is the most important part, because that says um, how much is due, how many months, um, what, what it should look like basically. Um, and so uh, th this puts the tenant on notice of what the landlord says that they actually owe. And Kelly, there are two folks with their um, hands up in the chat, Yolanda and Shalimar. So yeah. Yolanda, I'm just gonna um, go ahead if you wanna ask your question. I apologize if we kept you waiting. I went ahead and had you, you can unmute if you'd like. Nope. If she pops back in, we'll have her. I can't unmute her myself. I can just ask her to, so she maybe got her question answered. Yeah. Or type it in the chat or the question and answer box. That's great, thank you. Did you say there's another one? Yes, we have a question from Sal Shalimar. Is it illegal to ask for last month's rent? Um, at the beginning, I think this means at the beginning um, of the lease, and it depends, it's part of the Security Deposit Act. And so the Security Deposit can only be one, one month, one and a half months. And the last month's rent is sometimes used to 
claim uh, more than one and a half months rent because they're saying we collect uh, last month's rent as well, if they also are collecting a security deposit that is illegal um, because it will push them over the one and a half um, months rent by the amount that they're having to pay up front to get into the property. <clears throat> Which also happens all the time. So this was my uh, non-payment of rent, highlighted yellow. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, Kelly. I think Yolanda did unmute. Did you want to ask your question, Yolanda? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was having a problem with the mute. Um, well, I do apologize because I came into the meeting like maybe seven minutes late, but I, and I don't know if it was discussed already, but I have a question. Um, I had a neighbor. Unfortunately, he passed away. Um, his house basically, I would say it should have been demolished, but um, because he was only paying real cheap rent, his house was like basically falling apart. And I will tell him you need to call the city or you need to not pay the rent until the landlord fixes the issue. Uh, he had holes in the walls, like literally like going towards outside or holes in the floor that the cold air will come in. Um, I guess because he was afraid of getting evicted, which I told him he should just get another apartment, uh, another place. Um, what can we tell people that are afraid that they will get evicted if, if they ask to get the place fixed? Thank yeah, you, so Yolanda. I'm, yeah. So I'm going to talk about repairs for a little bit in a couple of slides. Um, but I will say if somebody does um, request repairs or asks for an inspection and they get evicted because of that, that's a violation of the law. That's a retaliatory eviction um, that shouldn't be able to go forward. Because unfortunately, lots of people are in that position where they need repairs and it's very bad or dangerous, but people are afraid to assert their rights because then they are afraid they're not going to have their housing. Okay, now this is the complaint for termination of tenancy. So this is the complaint that gets used um, when the 30 day notice has been served. So just like the last one, I've highlighted um, what the allegation is, why there is a right for the landlord to get the property back. So um, we've got the lease expired. Um, the tenancy was terminated by notice to quit. So that 30 day notice um that there's a vi uh, the lease was terminated but per a provision of the lease uh the defendant is a trespasser when we talked about that when uh, or forcible entry was made or possession was held by someone asked after a peaceful entry um i will say the peaceful entry piece is usually uh, that we see the most context is foreclosures. So if somebody has lost their home to uh, mortgage or tax foreclosure, um, they've entered the property legally, right? Because they were the owner of the property. But once it's foreclosed, they're no longer the owner of the property. And so they can be evicted <clears throat> at that point because they entered lawfully, but they're not lawfully staying. Um, and then other is checked here as well. So um, there's lines at the beginning of what the actual um, action is and, and what's going forward. And so if this just cites, um, you know, like a, a just the paragraph of a lease violation, I always say the landlord needs to give more information because how is a tenant supposed to know what they're supposed to be doing if the complaint itself doesn't even allege why uh, the tenancy is being terminated? Um, okay. So I'm going to say, all right, if the tenant left the property within the amount of time they were given and the landlord does not take the case to court, do you know if there is a database outside of court records where the eviction would be visible to prospective landlords? No. Um, so how, um, so the only way that they would know that is if they can if if the tenant provided the name of where they previously lived um, and they 
call to do like a tenant reference, but there's not um, a database that has all of that information in it um, unless it becomes a court case. And so if it does become a court case, then that's when people can look to see, oh, there's been this number of evictions that have been filed against this person ends up on their credit report. Um, if repairs are needed on the property and tenant refused to sign a new lease, but has the new rental amount in escrow, can the tenant possibly receive an extension on the move out date if the landlord has made no effort towards repairs when going to court? Uh, this is a loaded question with lots of um, scenarios. Okay, so um, if the landlord is raising the rent as retaliation to the withholding for repairs, that's a problem, that's a good defense. Um, and uh, for the extension on the move out date. So there is a pretty, there's the timeline of what an eviction, how long an eviction would take before COVID. And then it looks a little different now, um, but the judge can absolutely, sorry, the judge can absolutely um, give more time other than uh, the statutory requirement, which is 10 days after the judgment. So the landlord, um, if they don't agree to more time, the judge can order more time. And is this form filed on the 31st day after to give the 30 day notice to quit? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, okay. So this is an important piece that people don't always understand. So the complaints that we were just looking at, both of those are looking for possession of the property. So possession of the property means who can rightfully enter and remain at the property possession. And so both of those are seeking possession because either one, uh, they're behind in their rent or two, the tenancy has been terminated. But there's another question, which is, is the landlord seeking a money judgment? Um, so if they are seeking a money judgment on those previous two uh, SEO forms at the bottom, it says supplemental complaint. Um, and supplemental complaint means they're seeking a money judgment. So that triggers and means a couple of different things. So not only do they want possession, but they also want a judgment uh, for an amount of whatever rent is owed. Um, and so if they're asking for a money judgment, this has to be personally served. Um, the, uh, personally served is the hand in the papers to the tenant. Um, there is an additional fee uh, to get a money judgment. And this bottom of the complaint has to be completed that says uh, what the money judgment should be for. Now, I would say a lot of landlords don't uh, pay the additional money for the supplemental complaint to get a money judgment. Some of them do, but not all, because really what they just want is their property back. Um, but if they get a money judgment, that means that they can start collecting on the amount that's owed um, on the judgment itself. So let's say the... Uh, there's a hearing, the judge decides, yeah, <laughs> there's a hearing and the judge decides, yes, the landlord is entitled to the property. This tenant owes $2,000. This is my judgment. Um, if the landlord had filed the supplemental complaint for a money judgment, that means that they can take that judgment and collect on it. So uh, like garnish wages or tax returns or put a lien on property. Um, a uh, landlord who has a money judgment has all of those rights without having to go back to court if they have a money judgment. If there's not a money judgment and it just says um, like how much is owed, but there uh, isn't a money judgment that's there, they would have to file a new civil case if they want to get like a garnishment for uh, the back owed rent. So always look and see if they're on this document, if there's a supplemental complaint. And I should have put both of them. But so basically, I'm here on this complaint. It's down here past nine. <laughs> um, and the same on this one. Oh, you can see a supplemental complaint on the non-payment rent.
that's not what I want. Okay. Um, all right. So duty of habitability, I'm going to talk about this for a couple minutes, um, which is mostly uh, about non-payment of rent and repairs. So um, every property has within it a covenant from the landlord that it will be kept in good repair um, and be habitable, fit for the intended purpose, which is for people to live there. That's a duty across the board for anybody who has lawfully entered the property. Um, there's two exceptions to this legal duty. So one is uh, if the tenant was the one who caused the damage to the property or the needed repair, the landlord uh, can say, I'm not responsible for that because the tenant is the one who created the situation. Um, the other exception to this is if somebody um, is in a one-year lease, within the lease, it can say that the tenant is the one who is responsible for making repairs. Now, I personally hate this and think it is, that it's backwards, not intuitive to everything else that happens with landlord-tenant law, um, but people can have that in um, their lease and basically it'll say just that the tenant assumes the responsibility to make repairs. Um, I always argue that that is just repairs that are minor. If it's a major repair that needs to be done at the property, even having this provision in a lease doesn't shift the burden onto the tenant to make those repairs. And so when I say something major like appliance is working, um, anything that's going to cost some money that's structural to the property. Um, the landlord can't offset that responsibility to a tenant. Um, and judges usually agree with that. So, but it's worth raising because it does sometimes come up. Um, so if there are repair problems, a tenant for the most part, has two options. Um, once they've provided notice of the needed repairs to their landlord. So their first one option is to withhold the rent and basically saying, I'm withholding all of my rent until you make these repairs. Or there's repair and deduct, which is, I need these repairs. They haven't been made. I'm hiring my own person to come and do whatever it is. And the amount of uh, the fee that that person costs or the materials, I'm taking out of my rent and I'm going to give you a reduced amount because it was your job to repair this and you didn't do it. So I took care of it. Um, so landlord fails to make repairs. I should say at the very beginning in, in this presentation for people who are moving into a new property should always take pictures of the property. Like before they move all their stuff in, take pictures. What does it look like? What was the condition of the property when you moved in? Because there may be some defects that are there um, that later a landlord may try and allege that you're responsible for. And if you have pictures, you can say, no, this was my move in and it looked like this then. And that happens a lot. Um, there's also uh, an inventory checklist. Some landlords, especially like the bigger complexes or um, property or management companies that cover a lot of properties will do the inventory checklist, which is the same line of reasoning as the taking pictures. So I encourage anybody who moves into a property to do an inventory um, worksheet and to take pictures of the property because it will only help you in the future if something goes awry. Uh, okay. Kelly, there was a question about that withholding of rent. Does that um, have to go into an escrow account? Um, no. Uh, there are provisions that says that it will be, will be held in escrow, um, but the law recognizes that there doesn't have to be like a formal escrow account that's like set up with the bank or at the court or something like that. The real question is if the tenant has it. 
So if they keep it in their bank account and don't spend it and it's there, then that's good enough for it to be in an escrow account. Um, if they don't have it there, then that's very difficult to say that it's held in escrow because we can't say that it's even in their possession at all, if it comes up. Um, okay. Is, I'm sorry, one more question. Is there a statute of limitations on getting a deposit back after moving? Um, it is, I believe, two years. It's at the very end of this presentation about the deposit. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so things that should happen it, when there are repairs that need to be made. Um, before the withholding rent, the tenant needs to put it in writing what needs repair. And that can be a text message. That can be an email. Actually, I prefer it to be either of those because then we can document like when it was actually sent. Um, or it could be an old school letter that works too if you keep a copy of it. Um, but if you don't have it in writing, um, it's, it can be a challenge to prove that the landlord knew that they were supposed to make these repairs and then fail to make the repairs. Um, if you do send it by mail, do it uh, certified, and this is the copy of the letters, um, and documenting with photos um, or other things to show the condition of the property is incredibly powerful. So once something does happen, like not only do you have the picture from this is what it looked like when I moved in. And this is what it looks like now. There's sewage in my basement. Here is my letter, my letter. My, here's my email to my landlord saying there's problems with the plumbing. It's pretty compelling for a judge. Like pictures always are compelling for a judge when there's repairs that need to be done. Um, and so photos, thermometer readings, um, this does come up in a couple of scenarios, which is when it is extremely cold or it is extremely hot. And so every property, there is a duty for there to be a heat function somehow that the landlord is responsible for. Mind you, the tenant may be the one who has to make the payments, the monthly payments on whatever uh, gas or electric is used. Um, but there is um, uh, the thermometer readings. So it's very hot <laughs> and you have an uh, air conditioning is in your lease. Um, we've used to tell people like go to the dollar store, get like a little thermometer and take a picture at different times of day to show how hot it is, especially if you are an elderly person or if you are disabled. Um, but in the same vein, if it's extremely cold and uh, your landlord has shut off your utilities or has not repaired uh, a furnace or something like that, having those readings multiple times throughout the day um, is also very compelling for a judge. So um, code compliance. So every jurisdiction has an office of code compliance. They're just called different things, different places. So like in Detroit, it's BC, um, but it will be called, um, like it could also be the Department of Buildings, um, but generally code compliance is what it's called. Um, and so a tenant has the right to request an inspector to come to the property to do an inspection um, of any need of repairs or problems to uh, the health and safety of the tenants. This is another great way to document uh, to a landlord of what conditions are needed to be repaired at the property, right? It has a third party come in who is not biased, who says, listen, this, this is infested with mice. You have to remediate that by doing whatever. Um, or there's broken windows up on a floor. Um, these need to be corrected. So a, a tenant absolutely has the right to make the request that those uh, inspections happen. They get a copy of what the inspection report says, and so does the landlord. And so we can then show judge, look at, it was inspected. This is what the inspector said needed to be repaired and none of it has been done since then. Um, 
which is supposed like they're supposed to come out within uh like three days of when the request is made um and then I, just a couple of kind of caveats so one about code compliance i do um i raise for my clients who have children in a home um, before they call code compliance, like let's assess what it really looks like. Because if code compliance is going to come in and say, this is terrible, nobody should be able to live here, it's not fit for um, habitability, that inspector can call to, uh, CPS and say, there's children living in this home that I just inspected that doesn't have running water or whatever it may be and so it's that's a conversation um typically if there's minor children in the home before that call is made uh if it's really bad so um about the i so i have them here get three written estimates before getting repairs that's it if you decide to do the repair and deduct um and so getting three estimates she will demonstrate that you didn't just hire your friend and you're inflating uh, what the cost of the repair actually was. Um, and saying tenants should not make costly repairs that they cannot afford, meaning don't do repair and deduct if you can't afford to do it. Um, but also doing major repairs at the property. I, I often caution tenants to be mindful that within you could potentially be removed from the property in 60 days even though you put like all of this uh labor and materials into this property and especially for people who have lived in a rental unit you know for like 20 years you uh could potentially put all of sorts of equity into that property and then lose it um because you're not the owner Kelly, there's a couple questions in the chat about tenant responsibility or landlord responsibility for pests, particularly if the bugs came from another unit. And there are a couple others about inspections. Yeah, okay. So is the landlord responsible for removal of the bugs, roaches, or is it the tenant's responsibility, especially if the bugs came from another unit that was infested? So if it came from a, a, another unit that was infested, it's absolutely their responsibility to remediate the property. Um, and what that usually will mean is that everybody has to leave for a while and they come in and heat treat everything. Um, yeah, so often so the hard thing about bed bugs is that proving where they started is hard it can be really hard um because the landlord pretty much will allege that it's you know that whatever tenant who brought in the bed bugs um and the tenant it's often difficult to be able to know like where the source of it is um but if it is throughout the if it is throughout the property, like without question, it is landlord's responsibility to take care of that. Um, inspectors work only against private landlords. What happens when it involves a HARA and P and the PHA deficiencies within the entire due process? Okay, so uh, there's a couple of things in this. So one is talking about um, inspectors, so code compliance come out um, for private tenants, right? And so inspectors can also go into subsidized housing. So the, this is raising the about the HARA and the Public Housing Authority. So in subsidized housing uh, situations, the property has to pass what's called the home quality standards, which basically is its own kind of code compliance for subsidized housing. Um, and so that property has to pass under that scrutiny of the housing quality standards versus the Office of Code Compliance. However, we do sometimes, uh, if something has been approved by a public housing authority and for rental and the tenants like, there's all of these problems, they can still uh, contact code compliance and ask for an inspection that way. Um, and then how does the age of a building related to code compliance can structures be grandfathered such as old doors, et cetera? That's a great question. Um, so 
it is by the municipality or the city or county um, that you live in, in terms of like what's grandfathered and what is okay or not. Um, and so that I like the best example, I think is lead. Um, so there's lead um, notices and remediation that's like federal law that has to be enforced. Um, but that will be if you do have the property inspected, that will be one of the things that the gets noted is if there's lead paint in the property or not, um, which can also be a barrier to passing the inspection if there's lead there. Um, that's the problem. Municipal doesn't meet federal. I'm not sure what that means. Oh, I think maybe you're saying the municipal requirements are less than what is required in subsidized housing. And yes, that's true. Uh, okay. Okay. So we're moving now into your almost at court. There's a court case that has started um, and what happens once the court case starts. So right now, um, when EDP, the eviction diversion program started in 2020, um, and it's still true now, there is a resource flyer that goes out with every summons that gets filed. And the resource flyer basically says, um, there are programs that can help you. Here are the local legal aid organizations. Here um, is the application to apply for the SARA funds. And so right now, those are still being used. Hopefully, what the hope is for advocates around the state is that there will be some version of that resource letter that becomes a uh, like standard operating procedure going forward, even after the SARA program is not in place. Um, so the tenant gets served. What can the tenant? What can the tenant do? They have a couple of different options. So one is move. They can just move. Um, I will say, anybody though, even if you've moved, do you have a court date? Please go to the court date. Do not trust a landlord who says, "Okay, you've moved. Um, I'll take care of this. Don't come to court." Ah. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> there are too many stories that I know of a tenant in good faith believing their landlord when they said, listen, I'll take care of it. You have to work or whatever it is that you have to do. Tenants should always still go because the landlord may not have their best interest at heart. And then they may end up with a default judgment. Um, so tenants always have the option of filing an answer. And so that's like any other lawsuit, right? So an eviction, case is a lawsuit. So it is the plaintiff who is filing, asking the court, hey, I'm entitled to something. And in every other type of case, the defendant is supposed to file an answer and say, they're not entitled to what they're actually asking for, for these reasons. In summary proceedings, you an answer isn't required. So a tenant can wait to just go to court. They don't have to put anything in writing um, in terms of if there's an answer or not. There is, I'm gonna give it an exception and then an, in, uh, an exception to the exception. So in Michigan, there are what are called five day rule jurisdictions. Um, there's a handful of them throughout the state. And the way that five day rule courts operate is that a landlord files uh, the complaint and gets a summons, it gets served on the tenant. And then the tenant has to, within five days to, to file an answer with the district court. So they've got to like go on and get one of those forms from SCAO or handwrite it um, and uh, give a copy of it to the landlord and file a copy of it with the court. In the five-day rule communities, uh, if the tenant doesn't do that, the landlord automatically gets a, de uh, a default judgment. There's no hearing. There's no decision about the merits. They get a default judgment. I hate five-day courts. Um, and some, some of them, like so Mason in particular is like my best example. It used to be a five-day court, but we were able to, um, it's a local court rule that we got set aside. 
Um, there are currently uh, kind of what we're calling COVID rules that are in place from the Michigan Supreme Court and suspension of this five-day rural jurisdiction um, has been in place since the pandemic began. I think it's going to continue, um, which is great. So you can file an answer, but you don't have to. Any and all defenses that a tenant has, they can raise orally with the judge doesn't matter which number hearing it is. Um, this is all under the court rules of what people are able to do. So let's say the tenant uh, doesn't do anything, but they appear at the court hearing. Part of the COVID rules are, um, depending on the jurisdiction, at one point everywhere had to do eviction court on Zoom. Um, and that provision is now not mandatory about Zoom, and I think it probably isn't going to go back to it, but some jurisdictions have stayed on Zoom, like in, in the 36th District Court in Detroit, they're still doing everything on Zoom, um, which has benefits and <laughs> has some negatives, but uh, the use of Zoom has increased uh, participation by defendants, and it really is like you do not have to take a day off work necessarily. You don't have to take public transportation to get to the downtown of where you live at, um, but that's an aside. So waiting to appear at court, depending on the jurisdiction, there may be legal services attorneys or staffers who do intakes on those dockets. Um, and so if somebody just appears for court uh, in one of those areas, uh, they'll be asked, do you wanna speak with a legal services attorney? And you get to go into a breakout room from Zoom um, and an intake is done and potentially the, the legal services attorney gives advice, or they may say, oh, you have these defenses, or they may say, you have these defenses and I will be your lawyer if you want me to be your lawyer. Um, unfortunately, right now, it's not mandatory um, for legal services attorneys to be on all of the dockets throughout the state. And that's just because there's not enough of us um, to go around and it's not uh, forced upon the courts anymore. So um, one other thing that I do want to point out in this, so this AO 2020 17, that is a Supreme Court or order that slows down the eviction process. So evictions, we call it, it's like a rocket docket that goes real fast, um, or uh, it's summary proceedings, basically, which means like this goes faster than any other lawsuit that someone can file. Um, this administrative order slows that down and says, hang on, there's a pandemic, we need to like make sure everybody is safe and what is happening. So it created a two court hearing system. So one's a pretrial and one is a second hearing where before COVID a landlord could file for an eviction, have a hearing within three days and have that just be one hearing and then get a judgment against the person. They can't do that anymore. And hopefully that one piece of it is gonna continue too. Okay, I see there's some questions. So Kelly, I'll defer to you because we have about 20 minutes left and I um, know you have a few more slides to get through. So I'll defer to you. We can table all the questions to the end and then have a hard stop at like 2.20 to give you 10 minutes. Um, I'll defer to you because I know you put a lot of time into this presentation. I want to make sure you get to your slides. So maybe we can go to 2.20 and then do all the question, remaining questions at the end, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure, that works for me. Thank you. And thank you everyone for your patience and getting to your questions. Yes, okay. Um, so we're still talking about what the tenant's options are after being served. So here we've got the, they can go to DHHS to apply for rental assistance also the horror right now, um, well, and going forward. But a lot of tenants don't do anything, right? So they, they get served. They're like, yeah, I know I, he's taking me to court. I don't have any defenses. I'm just not going to not gonna go, or I can't go, whatever it might be. 
Um, if a tenant doesn't go to court, um, they can get a default judgment entered against them, which basically says that the landlord is entitled to whatever it is that they're asking for. Um, if a default judgment does get in place and you, uh, a tenant finds out later, like I didn't know there was court, which happens a lot, um, the tenant can file a motion with the court that says, please set aside this um, this judgment. I have a good reason why I wasn't at court the first time and I have a defense to this case. Um, and so it would be unfair for the court to enter a judgment, this default judgment against me. The difficult part is that that motion to set aside the default has to happen within 10 days. Um, it has to happen within 10 days and uh, courts may require escrow of the rent while that is pending. So the escrow of rent is uh, the court saying, whatever your monthly payment is supposed to be, you need to deposit that with the court for you to get a hearing on if there should actually be a default judgment entered or not. Um, things I want to hit here for sure. So one is about a consent judgment. And so sometimes the situation is you go to court and the landlord says, listen, you need to sign this judgment because DHHS or the nonprofits are not going to help you unless you sign this judgment, which is not true. Um, but that's typically the scenario where a consent judgment is reached, but there could be other reasons. If a, per, if a tenant is not represented and they sign a consent judgment, they have three days after it was signed to come back to court and say, nope, I take it back. I want you to hear whatever it may be um, as my defense is before a judgment, uh, before the judge themselves hears all the evidence and then makes a decision. A thing that lots of people don't know is that tenants can be entitled to a jury. Um, and in Michigan, there has, there's very little jury uh, trials for landlord tenant, but the tenants have the right to do it. But the first time that they go to court, they have to make that request that they want a jury. Um, oh, and uh, important to know, if the tenant has any claims against the landlord, like maybe because of these terrible rep repair problems and they were withholding uh, or they uh, made the repairs, the tenant has the right to counter sue the landlord. Um, okay. So if it is a community where there aren't legal aid attorneys who are there on the docket, which is lots of places, um, we always advise a tenant to go to their first hearing and ask for an adjournment for legal counsel, um, which they usually get like a week in between. Um, the, the tenant can do a couple of additional things. So the tenant or their attorney, one is ask for the proof that the landlord is entitled to whatever it is they're asking. So if it's a non-payment of rent case, like I want to see what the um, the ledger says about how much is owed and what fees are being assessed. And that is not an unreasonable request, but the judge has to order the landlord to provide that to the tenant. Um, it could be the same, I don't know, like a subsidized housing complex and somebody's being uh, evicted for disruption of the peace and they're saying you got into a fight with your neighbor in the parking lot and um, I want to see that video that you have that you're relying on and sometimes you see it and you're like this is not at all what they're alleging it to be my client was like a victim in it or whatever maybe and then sometimes you watch the video and you're like "Ooh, we need to talk to the landlord about settling because this does not look good for you. Um, but anyways, the whole point is that you can ask the judge to make an order um, that the landlord provide to you basically what their proof is for why you should be evicted. Um, asking for more time of repair order. So for people who, um, so for me, like the most heartbreaking cases are cases where people do not have heat in the middle of winter and they are heating their unit with their oven and or space heaters, like insanely dangerous, but they 
don't have a whole lot of other options or the sewage in the basement um, or a pervasive mold, those kinds of things. If a, if a tenant is facing that, the first time they go to court, they can ask the judge to order the landlord to repair one of those things. Um, at the very first time that you get the opportunity to talk to a judge, um, if they'll let you. <laughs> That's another side. Um, so repair orders, um, always, if there are major, and so I say major repairs that threaten health or safety, um, judges should give an emergency order with that for it to be corrected. Um, let's talk about conditional dismissals. So settlement, um, this is how almost all landlord tenant cases are resolved. Um, that was true. It's true now. It was true before COVID. Um, it's usually negotiating about the amount that's owed or what day that there would be a move out um, are the main kind of things that uh, lawyers and their attorneys and I'm not lawyers and their attorneys, tenants and their attorneys and landlords and their attorneys almost always um, reach settlement. And it used to be true um, when we were in person, you would just, the judge would tell you to go out in the hall and try and work it out. Um, we're on Zoom now and they will put us in, a, in, in breakout rooms. Um, and a lot happens uh, over emails more so than in person because of COVID, which actually is, in my opinion, good. Um, but I put that here to say um, a tenant may have defenses, um, but they may not want to raise those defenses or they want to move or um, whatever it may be. The tenant is the one who gets to decide what happens going forward with the case. Um, I just put this in here about what is eviction diversion. Um, because eviction diversion was a program that was in place in some communities before COVID happened, um, which would be a partnership between the legal aid organization, the HARA, DHHS, the court, um, and then sometimes a couple other players as well. Um, and the goal of that was having attorneys basically on dockets um, trying to prevent evictions. And so that was true in like 10 communities in, um, all of Michigan before COVID happened, and there's still some in place from COVID. And so I think that uh, this eviction aversion concept will, um, will be in place, I think, <laughs> in the future um, in certain jurisdictions. Okay, conditional dismissal. So this is if you are, um, reach a settlement. This is one of the most important things that we tell a tenant to do or that we argue for if you're gonna settle. Um, so it is a conditional dismissal. And if you are in the SARA program and in court, it has to be resolved with a conditional dismissal. Like that's one of the stipulations to the landlord receiving the payout is that it has to be through a conditional dismissal. So what it does is it'll lay out the if it's not payment of rent, it will say um, this amount has to be paid by this date. Um, and as long as the tenant pays that amount or the HARA pays that amount, the case is dismissed. And that is important when we were talking a little bit earlier about what a landlord can see or what, what gets reported. If you do a conditional dismissal and as a tenant, you do whatever it is the conditional dismissal says you will do, on your credit report, it'll show up as dismissed. Um, and so that is important to try to get into second, that is important to try to get into new housing, but also um, to get into subsidized housing. Or it could be about a move out. But if the tenant doesn't do what they're supposed to do, um, the landlord can come back to court and say people need to be out. And I stopped keeping track of the time. <laughs> so, Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, I haven't stopped, Kelly. You're okay. You have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is um, not the conditional dismissal. This is um, what the, no, this is the conditional dismissal. Um, so it will lay out what the different terms are and like for the payment. There may be some 
additional conditions. So as long as a tenant, this is the form that gets used, it won't appear on their record. Um, so there, since we're like on the time crunch, I'm not gonna talk about the defenses, I think, just that there are different defenses determined by where the person actually lives. Um, but I do you wanna hit on judgments and writs quickly? Um, so if a judgment gets entered by the court, a tenant or a landlord only have 10 days to file an appeal and that appeal goes to circ the court. Um, that's a 10 day window for an appeal is goes by very fast. Um, but uh, if there's no appeal that happens, the typical timeline for when a landlord can ask the court for an order of eviction is 10 days from the date of the judgment. So after a judgment gets entered, um, the tenants have at least 10 days to move, or if it's not a payment of rent case, to pay before the judge can, or I'm sorry, before the landlord can go back to the court and say, this person is still here, I need an order to have them removed from the property. And that is called a writ of eviction. Um, this, so this is the example of, of the judgment, this possession judgment is important to see who actually um, is entitled to possessions. And so that's who rightfully um, can have the property going forward. And if it's a non-payment of rent, how much does the defendant have to pay to the landlord to be able to remain there? Judges have been giving a lot more than 10 days since COVID. It's now like pretty standard as 30 days. Um, so, Kelly, we have a little less than 10 minutes. Um, okay. Do you mind if we just take a second and address some of the questions? Sure. Let me just and see. is there anything else though? Um, I know it's all important, but it, I hate to rush you, but that you want to get to before we get to the questions. Yeah, I'll do this slide, which is about okay. the which is about the writ of eviction, which is, so the writ of eviction is the final order from the court that says, tenant, you have to be out. And so unless there is a signed writ of eviction, a person is not going to be evic like evicted until that is signed. People don't know that. Um, it's the step after a judgment. Um, generally it's 10 days. Um, that has to pass. And if the person is still there in the property, uh, the uh, landlord will file an application for a writ of eviction. Um, and it then goes to, there may be a hearing about if a writ should be assigned, but not always. And then it goes to a court officer, uh, a sheriff or a bailiff or a deputy, somebody who then takes that writ and shows up at somebody's house and says, this writ says I can remove you and all of your property. Um, there's not provisions about how much time has to, uh, a person has to be given on the writ of eviction. Usually the court officer gives like a 24 hour notice, but if a person is still there and the personal property is there when they come to execute the writ, um, the tenant forfeits all that. They can put it all in the dumpster. They can put it at the curb uh, and whoever, finders, keepers kind of thing. And it's terrible. Okay. So that's the one I wanted to hit for sure. If we want to do questions. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so thank you to the participants for all the great questions. I think that's indicative of what a hot topic this is and how complicated it is. Um, Susan is going to drop the slides in the chat here at the end so that you have it. And just as a reminder, those first two links on um, Kelly's first slide will be a great reference if you didn't get your question answered that it might be in those resources there. Um, so Kelly, if you wanna just go back to the Q&A section, sure. um, these might be backtracking a little bit to the topic. So thanks to everyone's patience who've been waiting. Yeah, sure. I think Shalimar was where we left off um, 
with questions. Okay. So what if the inspector says the home isn't livable? How long does the tenant have to vacate the property? Um, so this is dependent on the community as well. So I used to work um, out of Lansing. So in Lansing, um, they have a, a, a tag system in place. And so um, properties could get orange tagged basically, or uh, which say, these are repairs that need to be made. You have this amount of time to make the repair. So it'll actually like be in the report or you get a red tag, which basically says you need to vacate the property right now. Um, and so in different communities, they're called different things. So it can, the report can say basically two things. One is like, okay, you can keep living here, landlord, these are the repairs that you have to make though, or you can't keep living here. Basically, we need to condemn this property. Um, okay, yeah. So how long, how long they have depends on the community. Um, if someone does not disclose their criminal history on a rental application and the landlord finds out months into the lease, can they be evicted? Um, think about that for a second. I, I, I'm going to say no. <laughs> I would argue no. Um, if it's subsidized housing, it's probably yes. So like one of the conditions about subsidized housing looks at all sorts of things um, about if you're eligible and they should have done and they do criminal background checks. But if somebody like snuck by somehow, I think in subsidized housing, they could get the person out, they could evict the person. But in like private housing, um, I don't see anything under the law that that will allow them to later evict a person with a criminal history. Like the landlord has like a due diligence responsibility on their part before they move people into the property. Um, how will they be notified if it's a five day rule court? That's a great question. Um, and the, it, it goes out with the summons and complaint for somebody. So they have to like get the documents and they have to read it to know they are in a five day rural court. Um, and I see down here, is there a list of places that have the five day court? Yes, <laughs> there is, um, which I can send along for sure. Um, okay. So they're notified in the mail. Um, should the tenant call legal aid to get representation in court because the documentation states that one has to notify the courts if they need an attorney? Hmm. Um, so from my perspective, if a tenant is facing eviction for any reason, they should call legal aid. Um, so, uh, because there may be things that are there that the tenant doesn't even realize or defenses or are problems with how the eviction was filed. Um, there, a, a, a tenant is never required to have a lawyer though. Like a tenant always has the right to represent themselves and the court can't tell them that they have to get a lawyer. Um, okay. So then we've got the five day and one just says Detroit, but I don't know what that means. And then we have two folks who patiently had their hands raised. Um, I'm gonna go to Carol first. Do you wanna ask your question, Carol? And the other person is Shannon. And I know they were both waiting a while so they may have forgotten their question. Oh, Shannon, go ahead. Oh, yes. Um... I um, have been privately impacted um, by um, this process and um, your presentation doesn't really touch much on foreclosures. And um, I'm in the Western district uh, over here and my legal aid uh, says they don't deal with that, um, uh, you know, evictions with foreclosures. And um, so, uh, I was a first time home buyer, uh, missed a loan. Uh, so right now the state of Michigan is in deficiency with uh, foreclosure process in violation of NCL 600.3201. These uh, for, uh, loans are exempt from foreclosure because there's government interest, you know, those federal grants and community grants and um, things and taxation interest. So 
um, I've tried um, in every aspect to get this addressed um, through all three branches of my government. Um, and uh, I'm right now in communication with the city comp controller uh, regarding m many deficiencies <laughs> across the board, not just this one. Um, so I'm kind of curious why there's not this and that um, my home was foreclosed on by an attorney that is using a shell company and his wife is also a judge here in Kent County. So I'm just kind of curious, how do you guys deal with that situation? Thanks, Carol. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of questions in, in there. So I will say um, for foreclosures, um, when the foreclosure crisis happened in 2008, 2009, there were a lot of defenses that people could bring um, in defense of foreclosures. But through that period, that process, um, there were court decisions that took away a lot of rights of people who were the homeowners who were being foreclosed on by their mortgage. And so if you are at the state of an eviction, case going forward and it's after a mortgage foreclosure, your ability to raise defenses or claim rights is very, very small. Um, you have to show that there is a, an irregularity uh, in the foreclosure process, which is a really high standard. Um, and so uh, we legal aid used to do a lot of foreclosure work, but we don't do as much as we used to because there uh, are less things that we can do. And Kelly, Lisa but, was kind had, enough to put a link in the mute in the chat for some assistance. And I don't want to um, cut this participant short, but it is 2.30. And I also just want to be respectful of people's time. Yes, um, but that's the whole point. Why are, why are they not putting this in tenants right uh, when, you, it's, when there's fraud and deception, it's void. And that's the highest aspect when it's already on the books that you cannot apply uh, power sale to a non-judicial aspect of these uh, loans, it clearly already states, and the state has been doing it since 1966, it's been on the books. And so that's what I'm saying. Why are the people being advised correctly on their true rights? I don't know that I'm going to have an answer that will satisfy you. Um, uh, and I'm going to jump in here again. I, I don't want to be disrespectful to that participant, but we have about 100 folks still on the call. And I just want to make sure um, I had several people message me privately to make sure they could get access to the slides. So um, Susan dropped them in the chat at 224 p.m. If you can't see them, um, so shoot a message out here and I'll repost them, but you should be able to get to them. And I will um, make sure that we post this once we have it uploaded to YouTube, the entire presentation. It's a massive topic. And Kelly, you just did a phenomenal job on trying to cover a lot of information in an hour and a half. So if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. Um, we'll repost that PowerPoint um, again. I'm hoping you can see it. And if you can't, you can email me at astevenson at mihomeless.org. And I will do my best to send it out to you. I'll put it in the chat if you have some reason you can't get to it. But I want to thank Kelly for her time. She is incredibly busy. And um, this was really helpful. And obviously, it's a hot topic. So I will talk to our training coordinator um, that perhaps not with Kelly necessarily, but someone um, to revisit this topic, because clearly there's a lot of questions. So Kelly, is there anything you want to just um, end on? And we want to thank you again on behalf of Micah for your time and expertise today. Sure. Um, I just, I'm happy. I got, uh, I'm happy to come back. <laughs> and if they're like hit on things, like we didn't really talk about defenses. So um, I will put out there that, uh, that's a possibility because, you know, all of the people who are in this uh, conversation, this training, you guys, you're like the frontline workers who right. knowing this information can be incredibly powerful um, for lots of reasons. So I- Kelly and Allison and I can sit down soon and um, look at your calendar because the demand is definitely there to see what works for you and we can revisit that.
Yeah. Um, so everyone, I just want to say again, because I'm still getting messages right in the last thing in the chat is evictions for Mike. It's a PowerPoint slide. Um, hopefully you can download that. Um, and if not, you have my email address. I'll send it out to you directly. So thank you so much, Kelly, for your time sure. um, and your expertise. And we will look at perhaps scheduling some follow-up discussions and training around it as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.